to see everybody here today. I want to make a few announcements and we'll get started. Uh, first off, just again, a few reminders for you. Uh, offering, we will not be passing offering plate. There's plates here down at the front, plates there as you come in through those front doors uh, that you can drop off your offering at. Uh, after the service, you can just come drop those off. Again, I want to remind you, you can still give online with Baptist.com right there on our homepage. Uh, there's a link for you to give online. Uh, and then again, that'll, that'll continue to be there for us. Uh, also, if you get to where you feel comfortable sitting in here, we want everybody to feel comfortable, safe. Uh, there is overflow behind me downstairs in the room. There's the TV that'll be broadcasting the camera feed down there. So if you want to go, feel like you want to spread out a little bit more, that is available as well. I also want to remind you, we're still having our Wednesday night services. We meet in here. Uh, we still practice our social distancing, uh, but we have our Bible study, prayer meeting, and then youth activities as well on Wednesday night. Well, it's good to see everyone. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and get started. Father, we are grateful to be here, to worship you, to fellowship with one another. And Father, we just pray that every single thing we do here today brings you glory, honor, and praise. And Father, as you are exalted, Lord, we ask that you would draw men and women unto yourself. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. Brother Cody. Uh, one more announcement. Um, July 18th. Man, I, I, I need a new prescription. Uh, July 18th, there's a uh, drive-through baby shower for Reed. Uh, this is for Joel, Chris, and Reed um, at 10 a.m. So it's here, right? Don't drive through at their house. Drive through here. Um, drop off a Target gift card, diapers, wipes, just money, anything. Um, and bless them as they bless us with, with their ministry here. Um, so now let's sing together and sing. Um, Psalms 30, 1 through 4 says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Let's lift his name this morning.
continue our singing, continue our leaning. Hymn number 572, Blessed Assurance. with you today out of Hebrews chapter 10 starting in verse 19. Hebrews 10 verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray. Father, through song and word, as we exalt you, Lord, I just pray you would stir in our hearts a greater affection for you, a greater understanding of what you've accomplished on our behalf, and a greater confidence in Jesus Christ. Lord, move on our hearts and our minds that our souls may be transformed. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Sacrifice. 
sacrifice is greater, holy spotless lamb. Jesus, you are greater. Jesus, you are greater. Let's stand together as we continue to sing. In continue to sing hymn number 330, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood, Jesus. thank you most of all for your blood, uh, for what you did for us on the cross. We pray that our, our worship will be pleasing to you, not only in song, but in our giving and also in our living. I pray that we would live righteously and point others to you. 
Um, I pray you would continue to be with this service, that we would lift you up and glorify you as we uh, look into your word. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Miss Belinda. Join me in Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Reference earlier, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, continuing our series through the book of Hebrews entitled Jesus is Greater. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. There are times in my life, believe it or not, that with a group of people, I remain very silent. I don't talk. I just sit there. And it's not because I'm necessarily shy, though as a younger kid, I was very shy. As I got older, I got over it. Uh, you probably realize that from time to time. Um, but there's still moments that I enter into a room with a group of people, and 
dependent on the situation and the circumstances and who I'm in there with, I may just sit there silently. Typically, it's because I have a lack of confidence in the knowledge of what's happening, what's going on, or I have a lack of confidence in comparison to the knowledge of the people that are actually doing the talking at the time in the room. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, during Chris Ann's last pregnancy, which was not that long ago, uh, with Nathan, <laughs> uh, I went to most of her doctor visits uh, to get checkups on him. Most of them. I didn't go to all of them, but I went to a lot of them. I wanted to be there uh, just, just to hear what the doctor said. I wanted to hear what was going on with my son. And just in case we were able to get an ultrasound that day, I wanted to be present, be able to see that. Uh, with the pandemic, I've only gone to just one appointment, the first ultrasound with Reed, and I haven't been back since or been able to go. But with Nathan, I was there at most of them. And so we go and, uh, you know, the, the nurse comes in and she tests her and then the doctor comes in and we enter in this room and there's this cubby hole off to the side that they have and I go sit in my little cubby hole and I sit there and I wait and the doctor comes in and her and Chris Ann begin to talk and she's telling us what's going on and she's testing everything. I'm just sitting there and she's telling us what's going to happen in the next appointment, what to expect in the coming days and how everything's looking and I'm just nodding along pretending like I know what's going on uh, and then she leaves the room and we leave the daughter's office and as we get to the car I look at Chris Ann and I go okay now tell me what happened and what she was talking about because in that moment I don't have a lot of confidence on the subject matter that's taking place all right like I've never carried a child before I've never been pregnant I know shock right but I've never been pregnant I don't know what they're talking about I don't have a lot of medical knowledge either the only time that I I get to ask a question is when Chris Ann told me to remind her to ask that question at the appointment. That's the only time I get to share anything in that moment. I don't have a lot of confidence in that conversation. They know way more about what's going on than I do, so I just sit there quietly. I don't want to look dumb. I think about Mark Twain's quote often in those moments. It's better to remain silent and thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. So I just sit there and I sit quietly and I wait till it's done and then with Chris Ann I'll ask okay tell me like translate that to me in the language that I would understand like dumb that down for me there's other conversations that I have a lot of confidence in I can sit down with many people and I can talk about theology and I can talk about scripture and I'm very confident in what I know or studied and, and I can tell you and share with you uh, what I believe or my convictions. I'm very confident. But even in the midst of that, I've sat down with people that know way more about the scripture and about theology than I do. And I typically just sit there and I let them talk. And then if I can figure out a way to ask a question, I'll ask a question. But it all comes back to my confidence on the subject matter. There's another situation though in my life that involves someone that is infinitely more knowledgeable than I am and infinitely more powerful than I am. And that of course is the one true God. And the difference between my meetings with him versus my meetings with the doctor for Chris Ann is that I'm able to go to this God who knows way more than a doctor, way more than I do, but yet I go and I speak to Him with great confidence. Not because of what I bring to the situation, not because of the knowledge that I have obtained, but simply because of who He is and what Christ has done on my behalf. And the author of Hebrews is drawing this early church to their confidence to boldly boldly approach God to boldly approach His throne because of what Christ has accomplished, not because of some sacrificial system, not because of their works and deeds, not because of the religiousness that they practice or the knowledge that they gain of Scripture, but simply because of what Christ has provided for us. So I want us to log that away today that we have confidence because of Christ. We have confidence because of Christ. So there's a couple of things that breaks that down here in our passage. Right away there in verse 19, he begins to unload that for us. So he says, Therefore, brothers, 
since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Now, again, up to this point, he's talked a lot about the tabernacle, the tent, and, and when he talks about that presence of God, he's talking about the inner part of the tabernacle. We've hit on this for several weeks. Like, look, like I know, as you walk through Hebrews, to, to 7, 8, 9, going into 10, it's very, very repetitive on the subject matter. He's hammering away at this top, but he's telling them, look, no one was allowed into the most holies of holies, the presence of God, except the chief high priest. And even he had to go in there because of a sacrifice, and all the garments had to be right. He had to wear just the right clothes. He had to set himself. Like, this was pre-pandemic, and he had to quarantine himself from everybody else so that their sin wouldn't mess him up before he went into the presence of God. So he practiced all these things, and then he's able to go in there. And even as he enters in, there's the rope tied on his leg with the bells on it. We've talked about this before, because if he if the bells stop ringing while the high priest is in the presence of God, means that he went in unworthy and he died. It's like very high risk situation here. And so that's what the Israelites' understanding of entering into the presence of God. Now, again, follow me here. I've told you this before. Look, I love you, church, but I wouldn't fulfill that role for you. Uh -uh. Joel's not serving as the great high priest. Nobody's tying a rope bells around me, and I'm not risking my life for your sin. I just not do it. Like, I haven't, I'm not there yet. Sanctification hasn't taken place enough. Right? God's moved my heart to that point yet. I'll let somebody else take that role. I don't have that type of confidence in myself, in my actions, that my garments are just right. Or that I've just made the right sacrifice. But I will go boldly to the throne of God and I'll pray for you and I'll pray for me. And I did it earlier before we met this morning in my office. I was going to God and I was praying and pleading that He would just move and speak from His Word. Uh, the service as the service started this morning, we prayed we approached the throne of God. Where the Cody led us in prayer, we approached the throne of God. How many of you were shaking in your seats at that moment thinking, I'm going to die. We're in the presence of God. I'm going to die. And with great confidence. Why? It's what Christ has done. Not because of who we are, not because of our accomplishments, solely based on Him. By His blood, He says there in verse 19, by the blood of Jesus, meaning not the goats, not the bulls, not other sacrifices, but by the blood of Christ, we are made clean and able to enter into the presence of God. Draw near to Him. In verse 20, that path that we travel to the presence of God is by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain. And right, again, sealed off from the holies of holies is the curtain. And it, like that's the sophisticated system they had to lock away the holies of holies, right? Just a curtain there. But nonetheless, no, everybody knew you don't pass through the curtain. You don't enter into that place. But what Jesus does in His death is He rips the curtain from the top to the bottom. The curtain is shredded so that we're able to access that. And it says the way is through Him. It's what Jesus says. I am the way, truth, and the life. And what else does He say? No one comes to the Father but through Me. What is the path that we have access to God? It is solely through Christ. Only through the blood of Christ. So listen to me, what, what he's calling their attention to here is what many of us need to hear this morning. And it's something that we've talked about several times over the last week, few weeks. And as long as I get to serve as your pastor, you'll hear me talk about it over and over and over again because it's the gospel message. Your works and your deeds will never save you. If you're sitting here this morning and you're going, I mean, yeah, I, I came to church, but boy, what I did this week sickens me couple of things. One, being sick and over sin is a good thing. It's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's good. All right? That's a sign that God's at work in your life. Two, the blood of Jesus is still sufficient. Still sufficient. We're not gathering here because we want to be better, or we're not gathering here because we're wanting God to bless us, love us, or keep us. There's some hogwash that's just being preached all throughout our country that people are gathering in churches and hoping that God would just bless them with riches and health and wealth and on and on and on. It's not why we gather here. We gather here in a response to what Christ has done. But it's only through Christ that we access God. It's not our actions, not our deeds, purely by the blood of Jesus flowed from the cross that we're able to even pray to Him. It's the only way we pray to Him. 
So if, if you're a lost person here today and, and you've been praying to God, your prayers fall on deaf ears. God doesn't hear your prayers because you don't have access to Him. The only people that have access to Him is through Christ. The first prayer that He'll hear from you is the prayer of call of salvation. That's it. So if you're outside of Christ and you've been thinking you've been talking to God this whole time, no, you're just empty words. It is only through Christ that we have access to the Father. Only through Christ. And so the veil is torn and the way is open. And now, because of that, we can enter into the most holy of places with great confidence. And he, again, in verse 20, he says, He opened it for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, His death on the cross. In verse 21, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Now, again, we talked about this concept of a great high priest. The priest would intercede on their behalf. That's the one that goes into the holies of holies. That's the one that makes the sacrifice so everybody may find forgiveness of sins once a year. There was other priests that would serve small sacrifices for all their other sins throughout the year. And then the great high priest was the one that was put into position to mediate a relationship between man and God. Jesus has now come in and taken over this position. He says, I'll mediate that relationship between you and God. I stand and I bridge the gap. Now think about that. You two, it was a man who was born of the right tribe to take the position. It was just kind of his inheritance to hold on to that position as the great high priest. But instead, Jesus no longer put, I mean, excuse me, God no longer puts a man in that position, but he comes himself as Christ to fulfill that role. Why Jesus comes as not only God, but he also comes as man, able to bridge that gap and fulfill that role as the great high priest. And so now we're able to have access to him through Christ. So he's just kind of rebuilding this. So it's two things that he points out that we have here in this passage. Verse 19, we have confidence. In verse 21, we have a great high priest. We have confidence to approach him because we have this new great high priest. So this is all a recap of the last few weeks, right? Last few weeks, 8, 9, 10, very repetitive. Everything that we've talked about, that, that's all of it into a nutshell there. So he's saying, remember this. So what do we do with it? Like That's the gospel, but now what happens in our lives? And what's the result of this truth? What's the result of what he's doing? So there's three things that he says here. And they all meet with the phrase, and he says, let us. And so he's telling us, in response to what we have, we have confidence to go before the throne, and we have a great high priest, so this is what we do in result of that. So that's how we're going to break it off. Number one, we draw near to God. We draw near to God. Verse 22, he says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we draw near to God. How do we do that? We do it, he says, with a true heart. Think about this for a second. What he's saying here, how do you approach God? You approach Him as you are. That's how you approach Him. It, it, it's not, you don't have to be something else or change who you are, or pretend who, to be something else. You just come as you are. You know, it's, we sing that all the time. But it, it's this truth. Like, I, I don't know, you, you, you've probably sat in church for quite some time, many of you for years and years and years and decades. Like there's, there's this draw, there's this stigma that all of us have to do the same thing or wear the same thing or act the same way. Like, listen to me, I know we have structure in a church in America that looks very similar, and we have traditional, and we have our preferences of what we do. Let me tell you something. Church that's taking place in India looks vastly different than it does here. Amen. They sing completely different songs. They wear different clothes and outfits. They don't wear the same things that we do. They don't have the same uh, uh, setup or structure or buildings and facilities that we do, but they meet with God just like we do. You, you draw to them just as you are. It all looks different in our lives. I, I struggled with that growing up in the church. I, I look at certain people and I would think, okay, I got to act like them and I got to do what they're doing in order to draw near to God because they've apparently figured out some great combination or, or some steps and let me go do those steps. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Like, ever looked at the person that comes in with that giant, thick study Bible? And you just like automatically assume that's the most spiritual person in the room here today, right? Have you, you ever thought about that before? Like somebody looks like they just walked in the family Bible that used to sit on the coffee table, and you're just like, they got to be spiritual. Look how big their Bible is. I just can't believe it. I'll go listen to them. Or, or, or you'll hear people tell you, like, you've got to get up every morning at the crack of dawn 
and you've got to have a quiet time, you've got to journal. And you've got to play soft music. Like, that just doesn't work for me. Like, that doesn't fit into my preference. So some of you, it is get up early in the morning. Now, the preference for me, yeah, it's better if I get up before the household gets started. I like that. I prefer that. That's, that's a time that I can set aside and I can pray and I can draw near to God. And there's other things that go on in my life. Like, for example, some of you probably wouldn't want to go work out with me. Uh, I don't know. You might. I don't do a lot. But you, may, uh, you may not want to because, for example, a lot of times when you, if you walk into where I'm working out or if you're to listen to whatever I got on my headphones, a lot of times it's a certain or an audio book. Like, that's what I listen to. You're, some of you are listening to some big time fast beat music, and I'm over there listening to a guy preach. Like, that's, that's just a time and a moment in the morning. If I go to the gym, I like to listen to it, and that's this growth. I'm drawing near to God in that moment. I'm, I'm going to guess that Brother Cody over here sometimes picks up his guitar and plays, and he draws near to God in that moment. I can go grab it right now, and I can play it. And I, God will probably push me further away if I try. Like, it's just, it not, it's not going to do anything. It's not a special combination. Like his guitar is not special. That we, but it's something that he has and a talent and ability he's able to draw near. It's going to look different. For some of you, it's going to be in the evening time. As the day is done, before you go to bed, you're able to reflect on the day and just in time with God. Reading His Word, getting into Scripture, praying, whatever it may be. Some of you prefer to do it alone. Some of you prefer to do it in groups of people. It's just going to look different. Some like to be outside. Some of you go, uh, uh-uh, too hot. I'm staying inside, and that's good sense. But whatever it may be, those are moments that you draw near to Him. It's just going to look different for you. The music that you may play, the books that you may read, all of it's going. So when we talk about drawing near with a true heart, this is what I want you to understand. You don't have to be something you're not in order for God to love you and to keep you. You come just as you are, with the baggage, with the mess, with your preference, with your personality. You don't have to act different. You don't talk different. You just come as you are. That's what God is seeking after. Up to this moment, He's been telling them, I don't want your bulls and I don't want your goats. I want your heart. For the entire time, they've been throughout the religious practices. And their hearts have been far from it. And again, the same temptation is for us. I mean, how many of you got here this morning and really just prayed and prepared your heart for worship today? It is easy just to show up because it's Sunday, pandemic starting to die down or speed up. I don't know, depending on what news channel you listen to. But nonetheless, whatever's taking place, you, you go, all right, it's time to go to church. And you come and you show up and, and you sing the songs and you listen to, you know, a smart, good-looking guy bring a message. And then you head home. Okay, all right, well, you know what? For, forget y'all too. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Love y'all. Anyway, uh, but you listen to the message and you listen to whatever. And then you leave. We get caught up going through the same exact action as the Israelites and our hearts are far from God. This is a time we gather to worship. This is a time that we come to draw near. But also, this is not the only time you should be drawing near to God. It should not be found just on Sunday mornings. And not Sunday nights or Wednesday night. I don't think you can fill the gap in there either. It should be every day of our lives drawing near to Him. And whatever it looks like and however it looks like. Now there are some basic principles of drawing near to God, right? Like, it's biblical, and, and, and the Bible needs to be involved in it. Scripture needs to be involved in it. Don't tell me I draw near to God by going sitting on a deer stand on Sunday morning looking at a tree. Like, that may be part of it, but if you've completely ignored the Word of God, you're not drawing near to God. Don't tell me I draw to God when I'm running my credit card through the machine buying something at the store, like my retail therapy brings me closer to God. No. Now, that may be relaxing to you to some extent, but if the Bible is not found in it, if the truth and principles of God is not found in it, you're not really drawing near. Now, you can go sit in a deer stand, and you can look at trees, and you can look at everything around you, and then you can reflect upon things of Scripture, and that is, yes, involved in it. But staring at water, staring at trees, staring at a shop does not draw us near to God if it's not built upon the biblical principles that are found there. Another thing that's going to be involved in drawing near to Him is your prayer time as well. Don't tell me you're drawing near to God if you're not actually talking to God. That's like me telling you I'm getting really close to my wife. You're like, we're drawing really close to each other. 
Or what do y'all talk about? We haven't talked in a couple of weeks, uh, but I feel closer to her than ever before. Some of you men are like, amen. I was like, I'm right on board with that one. Uh, that's not drawing closer. When I draw close to her is when she and I have times that we can just get quiet and we get together and we just talk about what's going on in our life. Chris, what are you thinking? How do you feel? And what's going on in your life? And what's happening? What are you reading? What's God doing in your heart? What's He seeking to you? Those are when we're close. That's when we draw towards one another. So, again, Scripture may be part of it. You can't just say, I'm drawing near to God if you're not reading the text that exposes who God is. And you can't say you're drawing near to God if you don't talk to Him. That may be different for you, and it may look different in your lives. But nonetheless, we're to do it with a true heart, genuine heart. So I'm just encouraging you, take some time, set some moments off, and figure out what works for you. Journaling and quiet time may be the way that you draw near to God, but it may not be. Reading your Bible in a year may be a way that you draw near to God. But if you're like me and you're a slow reader, you're like, uh-uh, I can't read the Bible in a year. I've got to take time, and I've got to chop it up so I can digest it properly. That's fine as well. There's no perfect combination or equation to draw you near to God, but with a true heart is a key principle there. So he says we're going to draw near Him with a true heart. Again, we come as ourselves. Also, he says, by fully trusting in Him. So again, verse 22, draw a full heart, full assurance of faith. That's that full trusting in Him. We come to God by grace, through faith, in Christ. Meaning, it is purely based on what God has done that we're able to approach Him by trusting in Christ alone that we receive that grace. And so we're able to approach Him. So it's with full assurance or with faith that we come to Him. And it says also there in 22, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the idea. You're not going to draw near to God unless you first off have trusted in Christ for salvation. Our heart sprinkled clean. That's again coming back to an old passage we just saw earlier in Hebrews. Talking about being sprinkled everywhere in the sanctuary. Same terminology being used there. Blood sprinkled on there to purify and clean things. Our hearts also must be covered by the blood of Christ that we may be pure, be saved, and be able to approach the throne of God. So the first step to drawing near to God is first off knowing Christ. Because again, going back to what we just talked about, outside of Him, there's no relationship with the Father. So, continuing. So, again, let us draw near to God. The second one that we see in verse 23 is let us keep the faith. Let us keep the faith. Verse 23, he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. Love this passage. So what he's calling us to is to hold fast, or in other words, to cling to our confession of hope. What is our confession of hope? Our confession of hope is simply Jesus paid it all. That's the confession of our hope. Confession of our hope is not in our actions or deeds, but purely based on what Christ has accomplished on behalf. Our hope is what we've talked about the last few weeks, that gospel message that our, nothing we do is going to save us, no amount of work is going to gain God's favor, but purely by Christ we are saved. By grace, un earned unmerited favor through faith, meaning we just simply trust in Him, in Christ. That's the one we put our trust in. That's our salvation. So we cling to that confession of hope that through Christ it's all been paid for. So when He's saying cling to that or hold to it, what He's, what he's telling you, church, and what He's telling us today is that if, when you're on the struggle bus, I don't know if you've ever heard the struggle bus, bus term. That's something we say a lot in our household. Um, pretty much every day uh, we're on the struggle bus. All right? and, it's, and it's just heading to struggle town, too, as we get closer to the end of August. But nonetheless, uh, <laughs> reads do. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're on that struggle bus in life and you're going, okay, God, do you, do you really love me? Have you really saved me? Have you forgotten about me? What, what, what's going on? This isn't what I thought. This isn't how it's going to play out the way I thought it was going to play out. Like I, it's not falling together like I thought it would fall together. We cling back to that confession of hope that what God has started in our lives, God will finish in our lives. And when God has started the work of salvation in your life, God will finish the work of salvation in your life. God doesn't stop, He doesn't quit, He doesn't go back onto own His promises. That's what He tells us here in verse 23. He says, let's hold fast to our confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. 
We hold on to hope, not because of what we have or what we possess or what we're able to do. We hold on to the hope that we have in Christ simply because of who He is. And He's faithful. Listen to me. He's faithful even when you're not. He's faithful even when you struggle. He's faithful even when you stumble. He's faithful even when you sin. He's faithful. He's going to finish what He started. I'm, I'm talking to Christians here. Those that have placed their faith in Christ that, but continue to battle that. Because you, you may be thinking, you may be sitting here because I've done this before. Like, I don't know if you've had these moments as a Christian where you stop and you am I really saved? Like, I mean, I know I profess faith in Christ. I believe in Jesus. I know that He's the only hope of salvation. I know all these things, but am I really saved? And some of those moments I've struggled with it. Deep down, I knew the Holy Spirit was working my life. So, yeah, yeah, I knew I put my faith. But, but I thought, hey, why am I still struggling with these things? Like, if I'm saved, it, did it just not work for me? Like, did salvation not take? And the truth of the Gospel kept coming back. Look, it's never been about what you've done. It's never been about your actions. It's never about your success or your strength. It's always been about His faithfulness. So if you're one of those sitting in that same boat going, hey, look, I'm still struggling. And when I say struggling, it doesn't mean that I'm intentionally walking in something. It means that I'm having something, but I'm wanting to get out of it. And I'm just still fighting that fight. If you've got that draw, if you've got that, what I talked about earlier, if you've got that disdain toward your sin and that struggle, that's a good thing that's called the Holy Spirit at work to make you hate sin. If you get to the point where you stop hating the sin, then there's a problem that's taking place there. But nonetheless, if we have the hatred there, that is God still at work. That's good. And what He started in that moment of salvation, He's going to finish. Brothers and sisters, you've got to put more confidence in Him than you. Meaning, check this out, draw it back to Scripture here. It means your faith, your trust, your confidence is in Christ, not you. Every bit of confidence I have is because of Christ. I draw near to God. I spend that time in the Word of God because of the confidence I have in Him. And I'm able to keep my faith not because of strength, not because I did enough good things, not because I'm a pastor, but because of Christ. Because He's faithful. Finally, the last one he says here. He says, let us maintain community. Let us maintain community. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love in good works. Now, just think about that. What he's talking about, he's talking about church. How we stir one another. He's talking about community here. He's talking about building each other up, loving each other, encouraging one another, edification, all these key words that we throw in with church. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about being part of a community. Listen to me. Part of the Christian walk is being part of a community of believers. It just is. So if you sit here and you think, well, I'm a believer, but I don't believe I have to be a part of the church. Like if you're watching this on the live stream and you're thinking about church right now, or maybe you're here visiting today and you've been thinking about church, but I'm not sure what to do. It is a lie to think that you can continue in your Christian walk and not be involved in the body of believers and community. First off, you were made for it. It's part of who you are. You are created in the image of a God who works perfect and has perfect fellowship in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God who works perfectly as three persons. You were created to desire such fellowship. You're not going to find perfect fellowship at Web Baptist Church. Because you're not going to find perfect people at Web Baptist Church. There's, the perfect church doesn't exist. All right, uh, the Robert Earl Grice, some of you are familiar with him, a pastor in our area a very long time. I, I still distinctly remember one sermon he talked about. He said, there's no such thing as a perfect church. But if you ever find it, leave, because you'll ruin it. <laughs>
Well, that's, that's, that's the idea of imperfect people entering into... There's, there's no such thing. But yet, nonetheless, out of that imperfection, we offer each other forgiveness because we know that we all are in the need of grace. So we just forgive each other and we keep pushing forward and we keep marching forward and we keep trying to love each other and love each other in the midst of... Like there's, here's another thing. There's no, thing as a, no such thing as a perfect marriage either, right? I was expecting more amounts. Anyway, so there's no such thing. Like, the Disney movies have all fooled us. The romantic comedies have all fooled us. All the chick flicks have all fooled us. There's no such thing as a perfect relationship, a perfect marriage. Listen, there's no such thing as a perfect soulmate. It doesn't exist. So you're not going to find that principle in Scripture anywhere. What happens, what should happen... This man that loves Jesus and a woman loves Jesus, they bond together and they say, we're going to love each other through it all. And they fight to do that. And they offer grace, just like Christ offers them grace when they fail. And they offer forgiveness, just like God offers forgiveness when they stumble. And they keep push, push forward to offer and extend that grace and mercy to each other. Strengthen each other to gain a better understanding of their ultimately our relationship with the Father. But we all desire such community. So part of the Christian walk is being part of a church, is being part of a body of believers. That's what he goes on to say in verse 25. So again, if you come up with this idea that you can be a Christian and not be part of a church, he says, verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Like right there he says, look, if you're a believer, don't neglect gathering with other believers. Now let's, let's talk about this concept of church a little bit. Right? We think about being part of a church and maybe your mind says, I'm part of a church if, if I just show up and attend. That doesn't make you part of a church. Attendance does not make part of a church. Part of a church is making a covenant to be involved and to serve with the body of believers. That's being part of the church. So attending doesn't make you part of a church. Now let's talk about the flip side of that. Being on a roll sheet does not make you part of a church. All right? We've, we sometimes twist the idea because a lot of people are church members because they're on a roll sheet somewhere. Being a church member and on a roll seat sheet does not make you part of the body of Christ. It just doesn't. Being part of the body of Christ means that you come and yes, you attend. And yeah, you may be on a roll sheet. Those all may be parts of it, depending on the church you go to and how they keep membership or whatever it may be. Being part of a belie group of believers is when you gather with other believers... And you worship together, you love each other, you encourage each other, and then you go and serve with one another. That's being part of the church. That's maintaining community. That's what the author of Hebrews is talking about. Don't forsake that. If you truly have met Christ, then yes, draw near to Him and hold on, cling to the hope and the faith that you have in Christ. And then get with other believers and hold each other accountable and love each other and encourage each other and then go serve with one another. That's what he's talking about here. So a lot of people in cultural Christianity, which is what we refer to individuals that maybe grew up typically in the South, they grew up in and around church culture, Maybe they identify as a Christian because they went to VBS as a kid. Or some people even identify, I've ran into this a few times, they identify as a Christian because their parents were part of a church that was local in their town. So they just assume they're a Christian. So part of that culture of Christianity is a lot of people want to cling on to keeping their names on a roll sheet somewhere because that makes them feel part of, that. that's not, that's not it. That's not it. Brothers and sisters, we have grossly missed it if we think that's being part of a church. Let me tell you what being part of a church is. It's when things are struggling, there's people there that love you and care for you. Those that are loving and caring for you, those are part of the church. Being part of the church is when you see brokenness in your community around you, you rally with one another and you go tend to it. 
being part of a church is gathering with true hearts, drawn near to God and singing songs of worship and praise. Being part of a church, yes, is coming and hearing preaching, but that's not it. Being part of a church is being part of a small group of believers, maybe Sunday school or maybe a small group study where you love and encourage each other. It's having accountability in your life. It's having people stir you, he says here, to good works. That's being part of a church. That's being part of a group of believers. May we be marked with those characteristics of Web Baptist Church. May we be marked as a group of people that love God supremely and love our neighbors as ourselves, and it's evident with how we live our lives. But it first starts with the confidence that we have in Christ. The confidence that what He started in our lives, He's going to finish. The confidence we have in the salvation. And the confidence that we have that at the end of verse 25, when He talks about that day that is drawing near, and it may be the day where Christ returns, or it may be the day where our time on this earth ends. But I can tell you what, whether we talk about the rapture of the church or we talk about the death of Joel Laster, I head toward both of them with great confidence. Not because of my life, not because of a checklist I've marked off, or not because my name's on a roll somewhere here on earth, but because my name is on the roll that is in the Lamb Book of Life. I hope in that. I trust in that. And because that's true in my life, I'm part of this body of believers. And I'm going to love with this body of believers, and I'm going to serve with this body of believers. And I'm not going to be perfect in the journey. I'm going to fail, I'm going to stumble, but I'm going to strive for it each and every day with the confidence that I have in Christ Jesus. And I call each and every one of you to do the same. But it starts first with salvation. Do you know Him? Have you trusted in Him? Or this whole entire time have you been calling out to a God that hasn't heard a word you have to say because you have yet to meet Jesus? Today could be that day. I pray that today's that day. Or maybe you're here and God's been dealing with your heart and you just won't pray. We're going to have an invitation. Brother Cody's going to lead us. Like I've been saying the last few weeks, it's going to look a little different. I'm not going to huddle around you and pray over you. I'm going to keep my distance from you. Uh, we, we want to spread the gospel. We don't want to spread germs. Uh, but nonetheless, I still want to come down to the altar, pray, pull me off to the side of the end, and we'll set up a time we can talk. And, and if it's about salvation, we'll do it immediately. Whatever it is, whatever God's dealing with your heart, you reconcile it to Him this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for hope the confidence we have in Christ Jesus. And I pray that each and every one of us today would maintain such a confidence. That as believers, we will live that out in our lives. It will be evident by our involvement in the church. It will be evident by our involvement in the community and those around us. And Lord, if there is someone here today that does not know you, have never trusted in you for salvation, God, I pray today is that day. I pray you have your way, that your will would be done. In Christ's name, amen.